Hey everybody. In this episode of Trek in Time, we're going to talk about crossing the line. That's right, we're talking about episode two of season three, Anomaly, which dropped originally on September 17th, 2003. As you should know by now, here on Trek in Time, we talk about each and every episode of Star Trek in chronological order, and we talk about the era that each episode dropped in. So right now we're still in Enterprise. We've just started season three, which is a relief both to me and to Matt and I think yes. to our listeners. We've I recently saw some response, which was was excited to find out about Trek in Time until I realized that these guys hate every episode. And we don't. I kind of <laughs> laughed along with it. <laughs> like, it does seem like that if you've been listening to us slog through season two, which was not as enjoyable as we might have hoped. But now that we're in season three, I think things are going to start clicking and you're going to hear the love a little bit more. And who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I've written some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. With me is my brother, Matt. He's the guru and inquisitor behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So we have the writer, the storyteller, the tech guy. That sounds like Star Trek to me. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing okay. I'm excited to talk about this episode. Right off the bat, spoiler, I thought this was a great episode. I'm, I was I, yeah, I, I just... I was I was really thrilled by it. And I one of the things that made me so excited about it, I had very little memory of it. There were elements of this that really came as a surprise. And I and I was knocked backward by how much I enjoyed it. Yeah, I I'm I love that this this episode came right after you brought up that one comment of somebody saying they hate every episode because spoiler, I love this episode. I didn't I did remember parts of it. I didn't remember the whole thing, but I remember parts of it and I I would yeah. This is why I was looking forward to season three so much because it was like they had their Borg moment from yeah. Next Generation. And it's like, oh, they found their footing and they found a story they can grab onto and, and make it their own. This is awesome. So yeah. we'll get into more of that in a, in a little bit. Yeah. Before we get into that, we can revisit some thoughts about previous episodes. Matt, do you want to share your thoughts? <laughs> yes. About Okay, there's a couple of quick comments I want to bring up about our last episode, the Zindi. And before I read these, Actually, after I read these, I'll give the explanations to what happened. So we had one I posted. We were having problems getting the episode put together. And so we had to delay a day. And there was a, a comment on that update from AJ Chan. We're already experiencing temporal anomalies from the Delphic Expanse, <laughs> which I thought was yeah. per pitch perfect. Thank you, that AJ. That is, yeah, chef's kiss, AJ. That yes. was. <laughs> but then on the episode itself, if you've watched it, Sean looks like a flipbook animation. He was, <laughs> this is not an exaggeration. He was going at 2.6 frames per second. That's wow. What's embarrassing so, is that's a little bit faster than I normally move in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so pale ghost 69 wrote, thanks Sean. Best PowerPoint presentation I've seen all year. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's another good one. That's and uh Robotrap wrote, How's the dial-up internet connection doing these days, Sean? <laughs> LOL. <laughs> now, I just have to say up front, this wasn't Sean's fault. Mm. This is my fault. We use a service called Zencaster to record this episode, these episodes every single week. It's, it's a great service because internet connections can flake out, and we want to get good video quality and good audio quality without the glitches in it. And so what it does is it records files locally, but we can see each other like a Zoom call. And then when it's all done, it's uploading all the files in the background. And then I have separate video files and separate audio files for the two of us that we can edit together and make it look nice and pretty. There's some things about Zencaster I'm not thrilled with. So we were trying a different service and I shall not name their service, but it did not go well. And we should have <laughs> tested it in advance. Yeah. But we th I just went in going, let's just record all of our new episodes on this service. And it was a horrible mistake. Um, yeah. And that was the 2.6 frames per second that we saw from Sean. So. No, we're not going to use that service probably ever again. And we're going to stick with Zencaster for right now. But I apologize to everybody. And uh, it was not Sean's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving me the out. Although I sometimes do feel like a flip book. So <laughs> I also noticed that Robotrav says about that, that he points out that this is like something we should talk about on our special out of time episode. Yeah, <laughs> uh, which I think is is a good callback. It's we recently had an episode that we shared from our spinoff episode, our secondary series, which is available to direct supporters. 
and Robo Trav is pointing out there that, you know, the time travel that was on display in our regular episode could have been something we talked about in the supporter only episode. Yeah. yeah. And Christian, a good pastor on that episode, the, the out of time episode that we released publicly so people could see what the show's about, uh, said we were talked about the new show, Strange New Worlds. And he said, yep, my thoughts too. It is the original series style, but just in a contemporary way. This is exactly what Trek fans want. And when yeah. Sean and I talked about it, he and I kind of, spoiler, kind of gushed about the show. We both love it. It feels very Star Trek. It's scratching that itch I've been looking for for years. Yeah. It's just fun. And I totally agree with Christian. It's like, it's just what Trek fans have been wanting out of Trek for a while. Yeah. So thank you to our listeners and viewers for those comments. I, I love getting that kind of feedback, even when it's to poke fun at the fact that our attempts at putting together our regular weekly discussion ends up looking like it was hand drawn by out of work yeah. Disney animators. Yeah. So in the background, you can hear that's not a problem with the audio. Now. That's the read alert. So it's time now for Matt to take a shot at reading the Wikipedia description for today's episode, Anomaly. Matt, do you want to jump in? Okay. Anomaly is the 54th episode of the American science fiction television series, Star Trek Enterprise, the second episode of the third season. The episode was, was written by co-producer Mike Sussman and directed by David uh, Straton. Is that how you say his name? Yep. Straton. His fifth for the show. Set in the 22nd century, the series follows the adventures of the first Starfleet Starship Enterprise registration, NX-01. I don't know why that's in every single one. Why does it matter? <laughs> Season 3 of Enterprise features an ongoing story following an attack on Earth by previously unknown aliens called the Zindi. In this episode, the Enterprise is attacked by an Assyrian vessel, and, is in, and in pursuit, they discover the aliens have information on the Zindi, which they must retrieve to help them on their mission. That actually is not that bad. That's a description. not a bad a description. That's you go that's Wikipedia. What I was say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I can't help but think is that the cloud think of Wikipedia is in agreement with us. Season three is where things really kind of click into gear. And now Wikipedia's clicking and into gear. <laughs> Wikipedia clicks into gear about that point because <laughs> the cloud think of Wikipedia is largely about the first two seasons. Uh, it's yeah. They were phoning it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this episode, as Matt has just reminded us, is episode number two, season three, directed by David Strayton, written by Mike Sussman. It originally aired on September 17th, 2003, and guest stars include Robert Rustler, Nathan Anderson, Julia Rose, Sean McGowan, and Ken Lally. So at some point, we're going to wrestle with the episode, but right now, we're still wrestling what it meant to be alive in September of 2003. Matt, you'll remember you were dancing. That's right. You were looking to find out where is the love from the oh. Black Eyed Peas. You're going to be dancing with that for a few weeks. It was number one for a while at this point mm. in the year. And at the movies, well, we can finally put the David Spade movie that Time Forgot, which made <laughs> $6 million last week. And that was the number one movie. Wow, what a... What a terrible weekend for movies that was. We've now returned to movies that we actually do remember. Once Upon a Time in Mexico was the number one movie this week at $23 million. Once Upon a Time in Mexico, also known as Desperado 2, was the neo-Western action film written, directed, produced, scored, and edited by One Man Shop, Robert Rodriguez. It is the final film in Rodriguez's Mexico trilogy, and it is a sequel to 1992's El Mariachi and 1995's Desperado. The film features Antonio movies. Banderas in his second and final performance as El Mariachi. In the film, El Mariachi is recruited by, recruited by a CIA agent, Sheldon Sands, played by Johnny Depp, to kill a corrupt general responsible for the death of his wife, Selma, played by Selma Hayek. This movie, I remember seeing this in the theaters. So too. here's Me one too. that I like, I remember this movie. I enjoyed this movie. And of course, if you don't know who Robert Rodriguez is, I don't know what to tell you. He's You're living under a rock. He's still making <laughs> movies today. And he is responsible for a ton of Star Wars stuff in the recent yep. Star Wars TV series. So speaking of TV, what was it like to be watching this show? Who were you choosing to watch? 
if you were watching Star Trek? And who were you not choosing to watch? Well, you were not watching My Wife and Kids, Graduation, which was a special two-parter episode. Matt, I know you'll remember that one fondly. Oh, yeah. That one had 10 million viewers. 60 Minutes 2, Electric Boogaloo, also had 10 million <laughs> viewers. That 70s show and The Simpsons were on Fox. Ed was on NBC. Pause for a second? Yes. When was there a 60 Minutes 2? <laughs> I believe there actually may still be a 60 Minutes 2. They, they st- decided to start airing it on multiple nights the way that oh, Dateline man. had multiple nights. They, they put together a second cohort of main correspondents. And in the same way that 60 Minutes would introduce do all the correspondence at the beginning of the episodes, they did the same thing, but it was with different people. And I believe that 60 Minutes 2 is where reporters like, I think, Leslie Croft started there. It's It was the birthplace for a certain number of the people who are currently on the main 60 Minutes. You can tell they don't watch it. That's right. That's why you're so uninformed. <laughs> And right. meanwhile, on NBC, people were watching Ed, 6 million viewers there. There were 4.3 million viewers watching Star Trek Enterprise. And Smallville was on WB, and it had 2.9 million viewers. So Star Trek was basically holding steady with 4 million viewers. I think we're going to see a lot of that range. This is a series that feels like it had a core audience. Mm-hmm. And it held that core audience for the most part but it had trouble reaching out and gaining new viewers. And meanwhile, in the New York Times, what was in the news? Well, this article to me stood out for its connection to the themes that I think we're gonna see a lot of this season in Star Trek. From the New York Times, the struggle for Iraq, occupation foes, Iraqi's bitterness is called bigger threat than terror. On September 17th, 2003, Douglas J. Jail with David E. Sanger wrote, new intelligence assessments are warning that the United States' most formidable foe in Iraq in the months ahead may be the resentment of ordinary Iraqis increasingly hostile to the American military occupation. That picture shared with American military commanders in Iraq is very different from the public view currently being presented by senior Bush administration officials, including Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, who once again today listed only dead-enders, foreign terrorists, and criminal gangs as opponents to the American occupation. I think that this fits in well with what we are going to be talking about in this episode in particular and episodes moving forward in the future. We have in this episode a Captain Archer who is more focused on his end goal than he is on how he's getting there. And we are going to see the growing unease of people around him, questions about his methods that despite his overall goal, the question mark around, is this okay, is going to be seen hanging over more than a few characters around the captain. And it was largely in the air constantly in 2003, late 2003, after the invasion into Iraq, the dismantling of the government there, the removal of Saddam Hussein. And as we've talked about in previous episodes, it very quickly turned into what do we do to win the peace? We won a war, but how do we win the peace? Mm -hmm. And did we win the peace or the war in the right way? At this point in Guantanamo Bay, in Cuba, the military base there, there were 9-11 conspirators and other people simply taken there with no courtroom action outside of a military tribunal. And there are still people being held there. Yep. So the question marks around what is okay for us to do. I, one of the things I looked for in my research for this episode was, had we yet begun to talk about the extreme interrogation techniques, AKA waterboarding Waterboarding. and torture. And I didn't find anything in the news of this day around that as a story, but that is going to come into the mix because that was a big news event. And we're going to see a lot of debate around that. And we see that actually depicted in this episode. It's, it's, a dark moment for the show, and it's a dark moment for the character. So to get into the discussion of the episode itself, 
right into the the nuts and bolts of what we've been alluding at. I don't see a need to go plot point by plot point for this one. I just want to return to something that you and I said at the beginning of this episode. I loved this episode. I thought mm-hmm. that it, for me, the the one element that I recalled was the distorted features of the Osarian that they capture. Mm-hmm. And his reference to this is what the anomalies will do to the people aboard your ship. So the the warning there being you will be twisted. You will become a twisted version of yourself. The metaphor of that can't be any more clear. It's you in your have, face. It's it's literally on his literally face. on his face. <laughs> the idea of like you come in as one type of person. We showed up here simply as merchants looking for new trade routes. And when we realized we were stuck here and couldn't get back, we had to do whatever it took to survive. And we became the twisted creatures you see now. So the Enterprise at the beginning of the episode finds itself caught in one of the many anomalies that they've experienced before. We've seen in the first episode of the season, the gravity plating stops working in a cargo room and the cargo containers are literally shifting gravitational pull seems to be shifting between the walls so that every item in the cargo bay is falling effectively from one side of the room to the other. We see that in action now ship wide as there are massive distortions of it looks like physicality itself of inorganic matter looks like it is rippling and distorting. And there's yep. nothing here that shows the kind of physical distortion of crew. There's no crew actually hurt by any of this, but you see the effects on the ship itself and the ship loses its ability to travel through warp and falls out of warp. They effectively now are accidentally caught in a spider's web because yep. what happens next is the Osarian vessel, which we will find out has been trapped on this side of the expanse for quite a while and has turned to piracy shows up and is heavily armed, very aggressive storms, the enterprise just to steal goods. Kill one of the, Os- and, and they kill some people. One of the Osarians is captured. This is far more. It's we've seen this at the beginning of episodes previous to this, where there's been some sort of unexpected conflict within the first few minutes of the episode to act like a hook to get you into the story. This for me is the first time that it works. I felt like the action coming out of nowhere and having the results that it did, seeing the captain go to the sick bay and talk to Phlox, and he is clearly, he's in mourning and he's also pissed. He is upset about what is going on and the fact that he's lost a crewman. Yep. The emotional impact here seems far more i don't know there's an element of realism to it that was on display i feel like the acting in this one hits a higher level not that i've been complaining about the acting in previous episodes but this one in particular felt like bacula is plumbing depths of what archer's motivations are in a way that that's really impressive and goes beyond what we've seen previously they're exploring something in, in Star Trek we normally don't see because when you go back to the original series, Roddenberry's utopian ideal of where humanity had achieved, you know, there's no conflict. There's no more war. There's no more hunger. It's like this beautiful, pristine thing. This is interesting because it's like right, it's before we've actually achieved all that. We're on our way to that, but we haven't done it quite yet. And then this terrorist attack is now being explored and pushing the show into a very dark space. And it's I think that's part of what you're was resonating with you and it's resonating with me. It's we know what 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 the federation is going to become, but we're watching those struggles that they're having right now. Yeah. Of are they going to lose their way? Is it going to go breaking bad or is it going to go federation, you know, with the prime directive? It's like which path are they going to go down? And right now they're flirting with the breaking bad path and it's really interesting to see Bacala struggling with this because he wants to you can t- he, he's the kind of guy that wants to do the right thing mm-hmm. but he has the pressure of his entire species on his shoulder he's trying to literally save earth and so that pressure is causing him to break and make choices that he normally wouldn't make and 
his performance is exceptional in this. Yeah. It's bubbling. It was bubbling under the surface in the last episode. And it's like starting to come to a boil in this one. Yeah. And it, it, so when he makes the choice he does, when he basically tortures the man to get information out of him, it doesn't feel like it's a hard left turn. It's like we've seen ourselves getting there yeah. just because of how he's been behaving all season. But I do want to kind of take a back step to where, how you preface this with the anomaly. I do want to talk about the anomaly just a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's interesting how they've, they're, they're very, this is one of those, I'm so happy that they went down this path because they've been slowly dropping the seeds of anomalies yeah. and that they've been saying, oh, it's bad. It's going to be really bad. But what they've been seeing is just more of an annoyance. And this is the first time we're seeing it getting really bad. And they discover the hiding place of these pirates, which are basically on a gigantic sphere yeah. that they speculate is causing the anomalies. So they're laying all these amazing mystery boxes of like, what is all of this? What is, right. This is all feels interconnected. And it's clearly a puzzle that the Enterprise crew is going to have to figure out. And I love all of that that they're setting up. And I also loved the Porthos alarm at the beginning yeah. of the episode. I just wrote down in my notes of like Beagle alarm. It's like, I love how all the animals, like Phlox's animals and, and Porthos, all sense the anomalies happening before the humans do. And I thought that is so, I love that, that little dash of, uh, that's what you see, like a tornado is about to happen. Yeah. And dogs will start barking. It's like, what are you barking at? Nothing's happening. And then the t- funnel happens and like everybody freaks out. It's like they can sense it before it actually happens. Yeah. I love that they had that element. It felt just a little, um, it didn't feel like an Alfred Hitchcock movie, but it was very Hitchcockian to me. It was like, uh, oh, something bad's brewing. It's like, yeah. Porthos is freaking out. And then it was like, oh, all of Flox's animals are freaking out. What's going to happen? It was a really nice tension building moment. So it's like not just the performances for me, it's the writing. Yeah. It feels like this season has been kicked up a notch and I'm just loving it. It's, 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 I'm right there with you. This yeah. to me was a very tight episode. It was exciting and a lot of action, but the performances of the, the dramatic aspects of it, of watching Archer go down this very bad path out of desperation, he's willing to torture another person to get information. Yeah. And, and you get that in that, yeah. in the conversations that he has with the Osarian before he actually tortures him. He yeah. is presenting himself, and we've had previous episodes, and now it's starting to make me feel like, oh, I, I, you know, I didn't like what I saw previously, but now I'm like, there's actually a lot of brilliance in the choices that Pacula made in mm-hmm. those episodes previous to this, where he had to pretend he was some kind of mercenary or bad guy, and he always put mm-hmm. on a kind of swagger to it of like, well, you know, I'm a tough guy. And that's what tough guys do. And it always looked to me a little two dimensional. Mm-hmm. And there was a part of me that was just like, why would Bacula make that choice here? He is making that earlier choice look like it's Archer's choice. Archer mm-hmm. is putting on that act. And this is what Archer is like when he is actually fully willing to step both feet into the dark water. Yep. And when you have that moment where the Osarian is saying, you don't look like the type of guy who's ready to do any of the stuff you're threatening. It becomes those, that scene is maybe two and a half, three minutes long. Mm -hmm. It really is the heart of this episode because that's the moment where Archer, you really through Bacula's acting, get to see Archer walks into the room hoping that the this captive will give him what he wants because he already knows he's willing to go wherever. He mm-hmm. knows it. Nobody else on the crew knows it. The moment he takes that guy at phaser point through the hallways and the guard outside the door responds with captain. Like, what the hell are you doing? I didn't expect you to walk out into the hallway. And then he passes another crewman and simply says, and crewman as if he is walking (laughs) along, just like, Hey Debbie, how you doing? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Hey Debbie, how's it going? It's just like, he walks past and says that to her. And she just turns around and stares at him as he walks away. And by the time that Reed gets to the, hatch where this man is now being starved of oxygen reed's response is you're murdering him you are going to kill this man if you don't 
change what you're doing. And Reed's response, and Reed is the one in the show who has been saying, like, we need to be ready for hard stuff. Mm -hmm. But this hard stuff goes one step beyond what he was talking about. He was never talking about torturing people. So Archer's willingness to go there, the steps that he's willing to take, and the slow slide through the first episode yeah. into this is very well timed. And I want to touch back again to the anomaly of what you said, which is, to me, this episode predates the series Lost by a full year, mm -hmm. but it feels very lost to me. It mm -hmm. feels very, we're going to add elements to this that are going to seem almost like magic. They are going to seem otherworldly in a way or even other dimensionally like they are not actually from this show and mm -hmm. when they find the source of what they think is the source of the anomalies and it's this gigantic sphere which they say is filled with fusion reactors only a handful of which are still operating and each one of those reactors is something like 12 kilometers long yeah so the size it's over of a thousand thing, years old. Too, yes, it's over a thousand out. years old. It's enormous. They're able to fly a shuttlecraft inside of it with ease. It's it's there's a massive superstructure which has a variety of fusion reactors. It is doing things to space that nobody can quite understand. And it's where these Osarian pirates have effectively holed up, which makes it the final battle sequence between the That's Enterprise. Incredible. Yeah, And the Osarian pirates, when they come back, there's no way of seeing through the cloaking field around this thing. So the Osarians have no idea that the Enterprise has actually found them, which makes that battle sequence, the logistics of all of it, perfect. I thought that this battle sequence was one of the best I can so, recall within Trek. I mean, it really, they're laying in wait and they're just like, have they seen us yet? Let's sneak up behind them and just shoot the crap out of them. It's so, an exciting climax i want I, I wanted to talk about that too because it's my favorite part of the entire show which was that it was like a submarine battle yeah between these two guys these two ships and i don't know there's a series of books i can't remember the actual titles of the books but it's, it's about uh, a guy called black jack geary and he's a captain of a spaceship in a fleet that's defending humanity and it's a whole series of books it's kind of a dime store novel level sci-fi mm -hmm. it's not great sci-fi Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. It's actually written by a former, I think, naval officer. He came up with the whole series of books. His battle sequences of how, sh how space battles would work is so accurate for what it would actually be like. It's right. disturbing. And there were elements of that in this episode with the, how they were flying and they went into the, the, um, the cloaking field. Yeah. And now, now they can't see each other. And it was like, it was like a submarine going one can go deeper than the other and the other one's trying to chase him down it's like we're getting crushed we got to turn around and go back and it was like right. this whole cat and mouse game that was super exciting to see how they were going to kind of face off with each other and it was it was so cool to see that um i'd recommend reading the black Jack area books if you're curious to see how space battles would work because it's nothing like you see in star trek typically <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's very cool but that that entire sequence was fun to see the crew and the captain of how they were thinking strategically of how to fight and like right. the whole thing of like well we can't just go tracking these people down we don't have enough fuel and he's like no we're gonna let them come to us and it yeah. was like the whole cat and mouse around the sphere and how he was going to trap them and just attack them as soon as they came in basically doing to them what they did to them on the way into the Delphic Expanse. Right. It was like, I loved it. I loved every aspect of that battle. But yeah. I do want to bring up one thing that we've kind of been talking about where the conversation between the Osarian and the captain, the first time they meet, this is the one week part of the show, in my opinion, the dialogue between them felt forced. It happened too fast. One yeah. of the very, they have literally just talked for the first time. And one of the first things out of the Osarian's mouth is, you call your, you're so moral and high and mighty and blah, blah, yeah. blah. It's like, you literally just started talking. How would you know that? Yeah. It's like, there's, there's no, there's no, it was like, they wanted to get a shorthand right to it because then they felt like they didn't have enough time. But then the entire conversation, they have like two separate conversations that take probably three minutes total. They yeah. could have easily strung that out just a little longer without adding time to the show. And it was just kind of like they, they ran into that too fast. And so and when I was watching the show, it was kind of like, what? What? You're yeah. too moral? You just met the guy. You just, how would you know that? 
yeah. would you possibly know that? I think that th for me, I I noticed that as well, but I quickly explained it away that there might have been an unseen well, moment where Reed could have said something to the captain of like, he keeps acting belligerent, but I keep explaining to him that we're not going to do to him what he did, but what his crew did to us. Like you didn't have to do that. that. You didn't have to. It, my, my whole thing was they could have been, instead of saying like, just from the way you're treating me, you, you're so moral. It's right. like he could have literally said that. And it would right. have been like, oh, okay. Because the fact that they didn't kill him on the spot and they put him in a chamber and they're holding him. It's like, right. and they're treating him with respect. And it's like, they're making sure he's comfortable in this little cell. He could have made a one sentence, just like, kind of like, just from the way you're treating me, you're clearly, you're too moral. Yeah. It's like, he could have said that, but he kind of, even the way it was done, he kind of regained a little bit of that. Oh, okay. When he explained his whole, when we got here, we were just like you and blah, blah, yeah, blah. He could have yeah. went through the whole thing. That kind of softened that initial reaction I had of like, oh, he's making a judgment call of like, ah, this remember, this reminds me of when we first came here, the way yeah. these guys are acting. Yeah. But it wasn't clear right up front, so it felt a little too forced. A it simple revising. Yeah, I, I think a simple revising of the lines in the vein that you talked yeah. about would have fixed that of, of instead yeah. of being like, you're too moral. I agree with you. Him saying something along the lines of, I remember when we used to act like this and that would have mm -hmm. been enough. And then of course you have the, the climactic battle sequence. I love the fact that Archer's entire thing is like, we've got less to lose in this moment than they do because they think that they can't leave. So this is their safest place. So we'll just threaten this place. I love the fact that it, when they go into the field and he's like, take us back to the station. Yeah. And then we're going to shoot the station. We're just going to shoot. <laughs> we're going to threaten Strategy. to blow. The, we're going to threaten <laughs> to blow this thing yeah. up. We're just going to shoot yep. it until they come back out. And the ultimate response to all of this is not about destroying that vessel. It's about stealing computer files. That I yep. love that it had that element to it, that they are trying to stay within a certain range of this enemy vessel simply to be able to use the computer codes to be able to steal the, the Zindi information that this alien ship has. And like you said, it is a depiction of in that moment, all the different members of the crew working together toward a common goal in a multifaceted way. Hoshi is furiously trying to maintain the computer connection to be able to steal as much of the computer information as possible. Meanwhile, the piloting of the ship, which is depicted again in a way that makes you wish that we got more of Mayweather, but Mayweather's mm -hmm. expertise in being able to fly the ship. And Hoshi. Yeah. And the whole thing with, you end up with a few moments where T'Pol is the one who keeps raising an eyebrow at Archer's willingness to go one step further. Mm -hmm. So at this point, she is the one who recommends perhaps we should look for other sources of fuel, other sources of the resources we need to continue our mission. And Archer's response is largely, I'm not willing to waste time doing that and potentially stranding us. The unspoken is also, I want to get to the business of what we're doing. And there's a, there's a heaviness to Archer's motives that's on display. And I think for me, ultimately, this episode is probably the best in a long time for me. I love this episode. Mm -hmm. And it made me very excited about the next one. Yeah, me too. I'm in the same exact boat. So listeners, let us know what worked for you. Did this one tick all the boxes? You can reach out the contact information in the podcast description. And you can also on YouTube, just scroll beneath this video, which should include me moving at normal speed. We'll <laughs> find out. And you can leave a comment there. Don't forget, you can become a supporter. You buy, of course, just doing what you're doing right now, just watching us or listening to us, you can review us through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is that you're listening. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show, click on the Become a Supporter button. You can throw some coins at us. And when you do that, you become a cadet. And when you're a cadet, that means you're automatically going to get the feed of our Out of Time episodes, which are about, well, whatever we want to talk about. It's usually going to be sci-fi. It could be anything from Marvel to Star Wars to Star Trek. 
or anything in between, but it's going to be stuff that we're enjoying. So if you want to be a part of that discussion, please consider supporting us directly through the trekintime.show website. And thank you so much for any of that support that you're able to give. Matt, before we head off into the ether, heading toward our next episode, do you have anything coming up that you want to share with our listeners? Uh, just stay tuned to uh, the Undecided with Matt Farrell YouTube channel. I have an episode coming up this week. By the time this episode comes out, it'll already be out about taking nuclear fusion technology and applying it to drilling for geothermal energy in the ground. And it's it's literally, Sean, a death ray. It's really, it's really cool. It's really cool stuff. Well, that sounds like great news. <laughs> well, it's not a death ray. It's a heat ray. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. You already called it a death ray. That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> As for me, please check out my website, seanfarrell.com, or you can look for my books directly just by going to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore or library. They should be available in all those locations. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your reviews, your sharing, and your feedback. All of that really does help support the show, and we'll talk to you next time.